Welcome to the UT Health East Texas Virtual Education Series. Today's presentation topic is PAD featuring Dr. Njoku, Board Certified Interventional Cardiologist at Tyler Cardiovascular Consultants. I am going to be talking uh, about a peripheral artery disease, uh, which is very common in most patients. Uh, but sometimes I feel like this is underdiagnosed. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, improve, uh, get the awareness out there uh, so that people can pay more attention to symptoms of peripheral artery disease. So that's my little introduction, and then let's go back, get into it, and then see uh, what the peripheral artery disease is all about. So the objectives of this uh, presentation is to increase awareness you know, with regards to peripheral artery disease. Also, we're going to talk about what is peripheral artery disease. We're also going to talk about risk factors, then touch about the symptoms of peripheral artery disease, as well as the screening and treatment options. So a little bit of background of a peripheral artery disease. So peripheral artery disease begins with the lining, begins when the lining of the, an artery is damaged. Uh, this results in development of plaque and cholesterol deposits, which can limit uh, blood flow to your legs and affect the wall's ability to expand. This decrease in blood flow and oxygen can cause pain in your calves, your thighs, and even your buttocks with walking or exercise. Peripheral artery disease also can occur in the vessels of your arms and neck. How common is peripheral artery disease? It affects approximately one in 20 people over the age of 50 or over 12 million people in the United States. However, PAD is only diagnosed in only 50% of the population. 50% of all patients with peripheral artery disease are completely asymptomatic or have atypical symptoms. Symptomatic PAD has 30% risk of death within five years and almost 50% within 10 years mostly due to MI, myocardial infarction, which accounts about 60%, or stroke, which accounts about 20, uh, 12%. So this is a little pictogram of uh, the cardiovascular events in patients with a peripheral artery disease. Um, so on this, on this side, uh, this increase, uh, increased mortality of cardiovascular uh, increase in the risk of cardiovascular mortality, and then on the lower part of uh, uh, this pictogram. Um, so for stroke, uh, in patients with a peripheral artery disease, the mortality is increased. Stroke is increased, amplified two to three times. Having a fatal myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack that can lead to death, is amplified four times in patients with peripheral artery disease. Then the deaths from cardiovascular disease is amplified six times. So this tells you that this is not a, uh, a benign disease. So patients with the peripheral artery disease, they have increased mortality. And this could be secondary to cardiovascular disease, uh, stroke, as you may see from this graph. Also, uh, this, uh, this, tell, you know, this kind of looks at over the impact of uh, peripheral artery disease on mortality. So on your left side, you know, it gives you the survival uh, percentages and below the year. So for normal subjects, people without any peripheral artery disease, almost at 12 years, they are living at least more than, you know, close to 80%. Now, um, now, for someone who has a peripheral artery disease in the large vessels, the LV is a large vessel PAD, they are asymptomatic. At year, uh, uh, at this, and the, in the, during the second year, the um, uh, impact on the mortality is increasing. And by the 10th year, they are actually at 50% survival. Now, when you have symptoms, that's very you know, symptoms that's very severe, at 10 years, your mortality is at 25%. So your survival is very low. So if you have to compare this to someone who has cancer, it's almost 
having a cancer on your leg but it's in your arteries that is blocked. So this is serious. I said we need to you know, pay more attention and increase awareness out there in the community. So now we'll talk about the risk factors for peripheral artery disease. If you have, if you're at the age of 50 to 69 and it has a history of smoking and diabetes, your risk is very, very increased. Age more than 70, your risk is also amplified. Smoking is the biggest risk factor for peripheral artery disease. So if you smoke, uh, this is what you're going to be getting yourself into. Diabetes also is another big risk factor. Hypertension, dyslipidemia, which is increased cholesterol, overweight and sedentary, being an African-American ethnicity as well, and also history of carotid come a, a renal artery disease, stroke, or heart disease. That increases your fa a risk factor. So if you have leg blockages in your legs, most likely there might be some blockages also in your heart or the neck arteries, which also supplies the brain. So that's how people may get stroke if you have a blockage in the arteries of your neck. Family history also is a risk factor for developing peripheral artery disease. So now we're talking about lifestyle changes and risk factor modification, okay? One, like I said before, smoking cessation. If you're smoking, you want to decrease, you know, amount of smoke or I'm, actually I'm encouraging you to quit. Blood pressure control would go less than 130 over 80. Your LDL goal, which is your back cholesterol, less than 100. Or less than 70 if you're at a high risk of heart attack or stroke. Proper diabetes management, you want to strive for a goal less than 7% on your A1C. Regular exercise most days of the week. Also a Mediterranean di diet also can help with, with regards to your risk factor modification and also proper food care. So major goals of treating and preventing peripheral artery disease. One, prevention and progression of the disease. You want to prevent the, uh, PA, uh, the, uh, the, you want to prevent the disease, but if you have it, you want to decrease the progression. So that's the goal. So you want to increase the functional capacity and quality of life. So if you have severe peripheral artery disease involving your legs, to the point that you cannot ambulate, or every time you ambulate, you have pain, what can we do to increase the functional capacity? We don't want you to just you know, be sedentary without walking. So you need to, you know, we need to do something to help you, you know, able to uh, walk. So we want to also improve the ability to walk, as well as time and distance of pain-free walking. And also, ultimately, we want to decrease the, uh, have a you know, decrease in death and disability from the vascular disease, such as stroke and heart attack. If you, if you can remember from my graph prior, I told you people with peripheral artery disease, they, they have increased risk of stroke and heart attack. So symptoms of peripheral artery disease. One, claudication. Basically, is a muscle pain, ache, cramping, numbness or sense of fatigue, which is usually happens when you're trying to walk. When you have this, you know, if you have a blockage in your leg, if you're trying to walk, these are some of the symptoms that you can elicit. And they typically involve the calves, uh, the thigh or the buttocks. So it's usually, the claudication symptoms is usually brought on on exertion or in any, work, any kind of weight bearing the exercise, such as walking and it's usually relieved with rest. So some patients may uh, have foot or toe pain at rest that may disturb sleep. Numbness or tingling in the legs, foot or toes. Impotence. Cold legs, skin changes due to poor circulation. Atrophic changes of the legs such as loss of hair and shiny skin. Skin wounds or ulcers on the feet or toes that are slow to heal or do not heal. So when you have any ulcer in your leg and it's slow, it's slow to heal, 
That means that you know you have a poor circulation because you need some circulation to get the nutrients to the areas that's not healing well. So if you're not healing properly, so that may be a sign that there may be a blockage, you know, somewhere in your legs. Physical exam for peripheral artery disease. This picture says a thousand words. So this is some of the things, you know, some of the uh, uh, physical exam findings, you know, we see in patients with a peripheral artery disease. They have absent or diminished femoral or pedal pulse. Basically, you have a diminished, diminished pulse, pulses in your legs. And usually this can occur at rest or after exercise. You have a bruit. Basically, it's a turbulent flow in your arteries. So if you're listening with your stethoscope around, uh, 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 over the artery, you may hear some you know, turbulence. So that's what we call it brewing. And that's a sign of a blockage. Hair loss, poor nail growth, dry, scaly, atrophic skin, and dependent rubber. So sometimes, you know, with your leg elevation, you may see a dusky red col coloration. That also indicates some kind of blockage in your legs. Pallor. Basically, your leg is pale with the leg elevation after a one minute at 60 degrees, which should return to normal color in 10 to 15 seconds. But what happens is in patients with a peripheral artery disease, it takes longer to return to the normal color. Ischemic tissue ulceration, like you are seeing on the picture, and a gangrene. So this is some of the classification I mean we use you know to describe you know the claudication symptoms. So this is a rutherford uh, classification. There's another one it's called a Fontan, but this is more simpler. So this is what the stages. Stage zero is asymptomatic. Stage six is the advanced you know ulcer and grand grain. So if you are, if you get fall into the stage of four, five, and six, you are having a most likely critical you know limb ischemia. That means that the blockage is very severe. So you can see from this next slide, uh, critical limb ischemia, so usually from four, five, and six. So this is the claudication pain scale. Um, actually, let me go back to the slide. So for your acute limb, so there's the acute limb ischemia and critical limb ischemia. So acute limb ischemia, this is very acute occlusion, and most patients will complain of, you know, sudden pain, there's no pulse in your leg, you know, there's a discoloration in your lower extremities, um, paresthesia, meaning that, you know, it's, it's sensitive to touch and paralysis sometimes, you know, that's like a severe extremis. And um, uh, the leg, you know, might not, you know, you lose motor sanction, uh, motor function. Uh, the claudication scale, pain scale, usually this is what we use um, when you're trying to do an exercise program, you're trying to prescribe exercise program, kind of like you know, want to tell the patient, okay, well, I want you to get your, your pain level to at least three before you can rest, before you can go to the next level. So claudication is zero, no, no claudication is zero. Four is muscle pain, it cannot continue, okay? So the guidelines for peripheral artery disease, that's just an exercise guideline. So someone with a peripheral artery disease is diagnosed, you want to medically manage it first. So, so this is what you, you know, you kind of press, you know, what kind of like a routine that we usually tell patients to do, just, you know, get the claudication distance, trying to get the pain-free distance to a maximum. So you start with a warm-up, about three to five minutes of walking at an intense, intensity level, which does not elicit claudication symptoms. The mode, you can use a treadmill, you can use a track walking, or you can use a low impact exercise, and then you can add a resistance training and stretching can be added as well. So duration, you wanna walk and exercise until you reach intense pain. Then you rest between intervals on the pain subside before resuming the next interval. Walk the number of intervals, it takes to initially accumulate 35 minutes. Then when you get to the, to the 35 minutes, then next thing is the progression and intensity. So once you can walk up to eight to 10 minutes prior to reaching a two to three on the claudication scale, then you can increase your intensity. In addition, add five or more minutes each week until you have reached a total time of 50 to 60 minutes. Frequency, you wanna do this at least five to six times per week. And then there's a cool down period, you know, which involves about three to five minutes of walking or non weight bearing equipment. So diagnosis of peripheral artery disease. 
want physical exam. You want to examine the patient. You want to assess their lower extremities. So you might see a sign of ulceration, gangrene, uh, 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 decreased pulses, you know, hair loss, shiny skin. So it, it kind of like tells you, you know, you know, maybe there's something going on, you know, which, you know, a blockage in your leg. So, but there's some testing, we, objective testing we have to, you know, use to confirm uh, what, we sus what we suspect. One is the uh, ankle breaker index, ABI. Uh, next one is the ultrasound, you know, duplex arterial ultrasound of those arteries of your leg. Next one, you can do magnetic resonant angi angiography or CT angiography of the uh, leg arteries to see if there's any blockages. Ultimately, angiography, which uh, you do an, air, uh, an angiography of the legs, which is invasive, that uh, you have to bring the patient to the cath lab just to look at those arteries to see where the blockage is. So this is an, an ABI. I don't want to go into much, you know, basically, this is how you perform and calculate the ABI. So if someone comes in, you know, it's complaining of some leg pain, so this is a, not, you know, one of the tools we use. So you check the pressures on your arm, whichever one is highest, and pressure on the uh, leg, whichever one highest, and then you divide the numbers, and then you get a number. So anything more than one to less than 1.4 is about normal. So severe obstruction would be anything less than 0 0.4. In the um, mild and moderate obstruction, so those are the numbers, we don't typically treat those. Those ones are the ones you may want to uh, prescribe exercise you know, regimen just to see if their claudication symptoms might improve. Duplex imaging, this is the ultrasound of the legs to see if there's any blockages. We use, this, uh, use that as well. And these are the velocities. And this is associated you know, stenosis, which is the blockage uh, percentage uh, for each. So this is self-explanatory. I don't have to go into details on that. but. Normal, when the peak velocity is less than 150, severe, uh, you are approaching the range of 200 to 400 you know, uh, centimeters per second in the peak velocity. So then uh, I don't really have any, uh, this is an aerogram. This is actually now you, f you think that this patient have a blockage. Now you brought this patient to the cath lab and you're doing an aerogram just to see if there's a blockage. You can see my, the arrow on your left, you know, uh, external iliac artery sh showing you a blockage on this patient. So um, this is basically, you know, some of the things, you know, we can encounter when we do this uh, imaging. And just kind of show you, uh, this is just a picture just to show you what it looks like. So now invasive treatment options, you know, for someone with a blockage, you know, peripheral artery disease, we can do angioplasty. Uh, Angio, uh, angioplasty. So basically, it just uh, go in there to open up the arteries and then the balloon it and inflate. Sometimes we can put a stent. So we can do atherectomy. Most people call it rooter rooter. Basically, using a, uh, equipment to go in there to shave the calcium. And then sometimes we do stents. So these are the options that are available to us. If we can do it by you know angioplasty. Surgical options is, uh, is also available, which includes bypass. Now, medications. Compliance with medication is important. So you have to take your medications. So the medications frequently ordered wants to decrease, optimize your blood pressure, wants to uh, lower your cholesterol, want to control your diabetes if you do have one, pain medication sometimes, and the anti therapy such as aspirin or Plavix, which is also known as clopidogrel, they can reduce the risk of heart attack, stroke, or other vascular complications. And also, this can improve your symptoms and also increase your walking distance. So take home messages. In patients with a history of, or physical examination suggestive of peripheral artery disease, the resting ABI is recommended to establish diagnosis. Patients with exertional leg symptoms and normal or borderline resting ABIs should undergo exercise treadmill ABI to evaluate for peripheral artery disease. 
Sometimes patients might have a normal ABI with just resting, but when they exert themselves, that's when they have the symptoms and then the ABIs drop. So most of the time when we order the test, that's actually how we order. We order with rest and exercise to unmask, you know, peripheral artery disease on patients that's not manifesting with rest. Uh, duplex ultrasound, CT angiogram, uh, magnetic resonance, angiography of the lower extremities is also useful to diagnose anatomic lesions and severity of a stenosis for patients with symptomatic PAD in whom the revascularization is considered. Antiplatelet therapy with aspirin or plavis is recommended to reduce MI, stroke, vascular death in patients with symptomatic PAD. Treatment with a statin, which is a cholesterol medication, is indicated for all patients with peripheral artery disease. Antihypertensive therapy should be administered to patients with hypertension and peripheral artery disease to reduce the risk of MI, stroke, heart failure, and cardiovascular death. Patients with peripheral artery disease who smoke or use other forms of tobacco are encouraged to quit. Management of diabetes in, the pa in patients with PAD should be coordinated between members of the healthcare team. Solastazole is an effective therapy to improve symptoms and increase walking distance in patients with claudication. In patients with claudication, a supervised exercise program is recommended to improve functional status and quality of life and to reduce leg symptoms. Endovascular procedures are effective as a revascularization option for patients with lifestyle limiting claudication and significant aortic iliac occlusive disease. In patients with critical limb ischemia, revascularization should be performed when possible to minimize tissue loss. In patients with acute limb ischemia, systemic anticoagulation with heparin should be administered unless contraindicated. Catheter-based thrombolysis is effective for patients with acute limb ischemia and a salvageable limb. So thank you for your time, for joining in today. I hope uh, the topic regarding the peripheral artery disease will help improve awareness in the community. Uh, patient can actually uh, learn about this disease that is not a benign condition, that having a peripheral artery disease is almost like having a coronary artery disease. We hope you enjoyed the presentation today. For more information about scheduling an appointment with Dr. Njoku, call 903-595 5514 or visit uthealthystexasdoctors.com. Our next virtual seminar will be announced soon. Follow us on Facebook to stay up to date on upcoming events and seminars. Thank you.